Hey there, folks. Welcome back to the Raven and the Writing Desk. I am Chris Lester, your host. And today I am here in the virtual recording studio with celebrated author Keith R.A. DeCandido. Hi, Keith. Hello, Chris. How are you? I'm doing quite well. It's been a long week and a long day, but it's the weekend now. So, yay. <laughs> I'm a freelancer. Weekends are utterly meaningless to me. It's just another day. Indeed. So I asked you to come on the show, Keith, because uh, I have been working on sort of investigating the different uh, corners of the world of writing and making a living as a writer. And I realized that there was this whole area of the creative writing world that I basically knew nothing about how it worked, which is writing work for hire for other people's worlds. And since I know that that is something that you have done a lot of and have been very successful at, I figured you'd probably be the best person to ask about it. Well, I, it's certainly something I can speak to, having been doing it for uh, over 20 years now. Um, yeah, no, I've been I've been toiling in the tie-in mines, uh, both as a writer and also as an editor, uh, for for um, over twenty years now, um, which makes me feel really old, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just for the benefit of our readers who do not understand, uh, or listeners rather, who don't understand what the difference is between a work for hire and a um, what would you call it, a traditionally published work. Um, can you outline what the differences and similarities are? Well, there's, there's, there's a couple different actual uh, different things we're talking about here. Work for hire just means that um, the person who writes the material is not the owner of it. Um, sometimes that can be a shared world thing. Sometimes it can be a case where... Um, one person comes up with a concept and then hires a writer to do it with them. Um, just as an example, when I w back in the in the '90s, I worked for Byron Price, who was a book packager, and um, he would do things where he would hire somebody like Isaac Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke or um, someone of that ilk to come up with a concept for something, or they would use something they'd already established, like uh, uh, Asimov's robot milieu, for example, uh, and hire other people to write uh, in that setting. Um, so that that would constitute work for hire also. Um, more specifically, what I generally do quite a bit of is um, what's called a media tie-in work, which is specifically, it is work for hire, um, should... Uh, is stuff that um, is specifically based on something in another medium. Uh, the most common is TV show and movies, but it can also be a book that is, takes place in the same universe as a comic book, as a video game, as a role-playing game, as a TV show, as a movie, uh, and so on. And so the basic difference you, you mentioned about people you know, hiring other authors to write in a a shared universe, and that's different from a traditional anthology because the auth in a, in a traditional anthology, as I understand it, the authors still own the copyrights to their work, and in a work-for-hire case, that is not the case. Right. It, it, if it's a, well, it depends. It, it, with a shared world case, it, it varies from uh, situation to situation. Um, as an example, I'm part of a shared world thing that Jonathan Mayberry created called V Wars. That's actually not work for hire. I still own um, the story that I wrote for it, and I own the characters I created. Um, the difference is that you know, if other people want to use the characters, they have this sort of a, an agreement that that other people can use the characters because it also does take place in the same world. Um, that sounds similar to what's uh, going on now with the uh, the Secret World Chronicle podcast. I'm not familiar with that, but okay. <laughs> okay. It's uh it's a shared world um superhero setting. Um I believe I'm not gonna to name drop, but there are some there are definitely people from the media tie in world who are involved in it. Yeah, and, and but basically uh uh 
tie-in work is specifically based on something from another medium, which is most of what I've done. I've done a little bit of Share World stuff that's, uh, and other things like that. But Work for Hire, in general, is anything that um, the, the writer does not own the rights to or the copyright to. Um, and certainly all the tie-in work falls under that uh, category. What's the advantage of doing that kind of work um, when you know that you're not going to get any more royalties from it? I mean, I, as I would, I would guess that you get paid up front or you get paid on delivery and then you don't. Okay, you, know, you, have, you, have succumbed, you have succumbed to one of the great fallacies of the Western world. Work for hire does not mean no royalties. It has never meant no royalties. Okay, um, well, I, as I said, yeah. I, when I, when we started this, I know nothing about this world, so that's why <laughs> no, I'm asking I have, this myth. This myth has perpetuated for my entire 20-year career. Um, <laughs> no, there is nothing There is nothing in Work for Hire that, that... The two have nothing to do with each other. Work for Hire just indicates who owns the rights to it. Compensation is different from one contract to another. There are some Work for Hire uh, deals where there is no royalty. Um, th but that varies from case to case. You do have to share the royalties often. Um, ah. uh, as, as, you know, the, the, for example, on uh, a Star Trek novel, um, to give a particularly prominent example that I've done a lot in, if you write a regular old novel that you own and keep with one of the big five publishing houses, um, you will generally get... Um, a royalty rate of about six to eight percent of basically any time a book is sold, six to eight percent of the cover price goes to you. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that has to you don't get right away because you have to first earn back the money they gave the upfront money they gave you, uh, which is you know referred to as an advance against royalties. But then after that, um, once once that is earned out. Uh, the book is sold enough so that that money is made back. Then with each one sold, you get six eight percent. With uh, a tie-in, that percentage is generally lower. For example, for Star Trek fiction, it's generally about 3%. Um, and I have done other deals. Uh, I did a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novel back in the... Uh, I actually did three Buffy the Vampire Slayer novels. And for that, the percentage was only 1%. Um, because the money has to be split among... Uh, some of that money, the royalty money that would normally go to the author, has to go to the people who own it. Um, right. You know, CBS Paramount, in the case of Star Trek... Uh, 20th Century Fox in the case of Buffy, and so on. Um, now, there are work-for-hire deals that don't have royalties attached to them, yes. Um, but that is not a hard and fast rule, and it is not a requirement. So. Okay. So, yeah. In, fa in fact, just to give one example, uh, I did a World of Warcraft novel um, nine years ago uh, called Cycle of Hatred, which I get a royalty check for every six months, like clockwork. Looks like it's 12th printing now. Um... The, the checks have gotten a little smaller as time has gone on, but that, that book has continued to sell and I continue to make royalties off it. So it does happen. Um, the vast majority of my tie-in novels haven't earned out as it happens, but the, the capability exists that it will. So. Cool. So what's the advantage? Um, that was to get back to the way that this question started before I was woefully misinformed. <laughs> uh, why write media tie-in novels? It's fun, man. Um, there's a number of reasons. One is, um, I mean, the primary reason really is because, and, and the best, you, know, you ask any tie-in writer, they're generally fans of what they're doing in the first place. Uh, I started writing Star Trek novels because I've been a Star Trek fan since birth. Um, it's enjoyable to take char these characters and these situations in this setting and put you, do your own spin on them. Um, so that's, that's a primary motivating factor. Um, the money is usually good, <laughs> not always, but uh, there's there's the, the idea when you're writing your own fiction, you write the novel and then you start chopping it around in the hopes that someone will buy it. Um, when you do a tie-in novel, you get the money up front before you start even writing the book. You you plotted it probably, but you haven't actually written it yet. So the idea of the guaranteed paycheck is useful. Um, that's only the case on a book-by-book -book basis. It's still, you know, a difficult way to make a living, as I've learned over the last 20 years. But, um, but the, the main reason, besides the fact that it is, you know, it is money for a book, which is, which is something we all 
try to do is get paid for our work. It's also fun. Um, it's it's enjoyable, particularly if it's something you're a fan of or something you become a fan of. I, I have been and over my career approached to work in properties that I was not familiar with initially, but I you know learned about it as included the World of Warcraft one I just mentioned is one um, where I, I was completely unfamiliar with the property to start. Um, but once I dove into it and started doing my research and learning about it and, and such, became a fan. Um, so uh, that that it, it's also a way of introducing you to things you may not have been familiar with, and also to work in in universes that you are a fan of. Um, I was I, most of the stuff I've worked in is, is stuff I either came to like or, far more commonly, stuff I was already fond of in the first place. How did you get started doing this? Uh, backwards, kind of, as an editor, initially. I, uh, As I mentioned, I worked for Byron Price, and uh, Byron did a lot of work for hire and shared world and media tie-in projects, and I worked on them as an editor. Um, the, the most prominent project I worked on for Byron, we actually did a series of about 54 novels and short story anthologies that were published between 1994 and 2000. Uh, with Marvel, they were based on Marvel Comics superheroes. Um, naturally, it ended in 2000, right when X Men came out. So, of course, of course, we were able to think yeah, right. It was like the worst possible timing. It's like just when the movies hit was when the the line came to an end. Mind you, the books did really well. Um, they were. It was a really. Uh, I'm as an editor, I'm extremely proud of that series. And, um, uh, but I I was the editor on that, and. Because I was an editor, it gave me the opportunity. For one thing, I wrote for the line itself. Um, I did a couple of short stories here and there. I wrote one novel. Um, other people in the company edited those. And then um, it also gave me the opportunity to pitch to other anthologies initially, short stories. Uh, that like There was a Doctor Who anthology that was being edited by somebody who had written an X-Men story for me. So that gave me the opportunity to pitch to him. Um, and then, you know, with each new story I did, that built my resume up, and um, another editor that we had worked with as a packager was looking for someone to write young Hercules novels, so I got the opportunity to do that, and so on. Um, so basically, the, the I got the opportunity to, to pitch things as due to my position as an editor. So It's not really a very replicable method of breaking in, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but that's true of most. I mean, you ask any 10 writers how they broke in, you get 12 different answers. You know. So I guess that leads to my, my next question, is if somebody is a writer who's interested in doing media tie-in work, how do you find out about these kinds of projects? Are there, like, calls for submissions? Is it something where you, you work through an agent? How does it work? Usually, um, uh, it's it's word of mouth. It, it's best to be established as a writer already. Um, there are occasionally things like, for example, um, Simon and Schuster did the Strange New Worlds contest, which I understand they, they might be reviving, um, which was specifically open to amateur writers, and that led uh, there's a bunch of people whose whose writing career, both writing Star Trek fiction and just writing original fiction, got started through Strange New Worlds. Uh, that's an exceptional case, though. Usually, uh, tie-in editors are going to go for people who already have experience, um, partly because when you're doing a tie-in project, you want somebody who already knows what they're doing because there's enough other stuff editors have to deal with when doing tie-in fiction, including you know working with a licensor and getting approvals and such, that walking a newbie through the process is one additional piece of work they don't really need. So they'd rather go with somebody who's already established that they can write a novel, that they can hit a deadline, um, tie-in work is also way more deadline-oriented generally than uh, original fiction. You know, if 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 I'm late with an original novel, it just means they shuffle the schedule a little bit and push it back. If I'm late with my movie tie-in novel, uh, we've lost our window for publication, and the, the editor's not likely to hire me again. So they want they want people who are already often editors want people who are already established precisely because they know they can count on them to deliver the book on time. Is that why you tend to see the same authors popping up in media tie-ins for all different kinds of worlds? Often, yeah. I mean, it's people who have already proven they know what they're doing. Um, it's it's a very specialized skill. It's not necessarily one... I mean, it doesn't... Uh, being able to write tie-ins, well, doesn't make me or Greg Cox or Max Allen Collins or David Mack or Una McCormick or, or 
I mean, you know, any of the other people who, who do it regularly, uh, it doesn't make us better writers or worse writers. Uh, it just means we have a particularly marketable skill <laughs> that we can, you know, we can do this, and we've proven we can do this, and so that leads to us getting more work. So, so when you get a new project, um, how much information do they give you about it, and how much guidance um, do they do they provide versus things you have to come up with on your own? There is no one answer to that question. It varies wildly from project to project. Um, there have been some tie-in projects where I was completely on my own to come up with a story, which was then approved. Uh, there have been instances where the plot was practically dictated to me word for word, <laughs> uh, and and every and every permutation in between those two extremes. Um, uh, there, there. It really does vary from project to project. Um, there are some cases where the licensor is very hands-on. Uh, as one example, Blizzard Games uh, is extremely hands-on with World of Warcraft and Starcraft and Diablo, um, because that's a very uh, tightly constructed world. Yeah. Um, the the Star Trek and Star Wars fiction is um, somewhat editorially driven, um, in that they have basic you know general plans for what they want to do mixed in with standalone things on top of that. Um, so they'll, you'll get, you know, big event things that are planned by editors, and they hire particular writers to work on them and collaborate with them on putting those together, uh, and other projects that are just basically novels that people have proposed. Um, the uh, Right now I'm working on a novella based on Heroes Reborn, which is a 13-episode miniseries. It's a sequel to the uh, uh, 2006 series uh, Heroes. Uh, on NBC, and I and five other writer-slash-writer writer teams are doing uh, novellas that are tying into the miniseries. In those cases, um, we were given a bunch of material, uh, including the scripts uh, for what's coming, and asked to come up with various and sundry ideas. The one in particular I'm doing focuses on the character of Claire Bennett from the original series. The, the, the cheerleader. The cheerleader, yeah. And um, that plot was, to some extent... Not so much dictated, but I was given guidelines as to what what there should be and what. So I got to I got to work actually rather closely with the people in the writers room uh, as to what they wanted to see for this. Um, the actual plot is still mine, but it's based very heavily on the guidelines they gave me. Um, other cases, you know, I've come up with it entirely on my own. It it, it there really is no pattern to it. Um, each tie-in line has its own needs and wants and such. Um, so. Do you, have you ever had a situation where you've turned in something and they the editor says, no, this idea that you came up with doesn't really work for us. We're going to need you to rework it completely. Oh, it happens all the time. Um, <laughs> but it usually happens at the plot stage. Um, every With a tie-in novel, um, and, and this is generally true for shared world stuff too, um, where... where where there's an additional authority beyond yourself and the editor, um, basically, uh, when the person who owns it or created it or well owns it usually uh, has a, has uh, approval and oversight over it, in that in any of those instances, your story has to be approved before you start writing. Makes so you sense. Have to write a plot outline first. Yeah. So uh, as an example, uh, there was something I'd originally pitched for Heroes Reborn, which they didn't go for because they wanted the Claire story instead. So I did the Claire story. Um, you know, but that that's usually taken care of at the plot stage, precisely so that the situation you postulated can be avoided. There have been circumstances where the licensor has changed their minds on it, um, <laughs> in which case... But the thing is, it's also contractual that we're writing our novel based on the approved outline. So if they approve it, approve an outline, I write a novel to that outline, and then they change their minds about it, then some accommodation has to be come to for that because I've already done the work and fulfilled my contractual obligation. So usually then there needs to be something negotiated, whether it's further compensation or something else. Um, and again, that varies. No two, con no two contracts are alike. So... Uh, what, there, there have been occasions where the rewriting had to get done, and basically it was like either you do it or someone else will. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and 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 I should add that 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 
the instances where that happens is vanishingly rare. I mean, it does happen, but it is very uncommon. The most common instance is you write a plot, they approve it, or they approve it with notes. You make those, you take those notes into account, you write the book, and then they approve it again um, once you finish it. Also, often with notes, in which case you make the changes they ask for because they own it. You know, um, ultimately the people whose in whose copyright the book is are the final arbiter as to what goes into it because it's theirs. So. Do you um do you have a a media tie-in world that you are just itching to write for that you haven't gotten the chance to do yet? Oh, bunches. Um, the, a lot of them are things that there, there's no chance of me writing in it now because the 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 time for that has come and gone. Um, I would have loved to have written one of the Battlestar Galactica novels that Tor did when when the reboot was on the air. Um. But that didn't happen. Um, I would have loved to have written a Homicide Life on the Street novel, of which there were two. Um, but they were written by Jerome Preisler, who's a, a mystery writer. And so I can see why they went for him rather than me. <laughs> Although I didn't know about them. But that was that was one of my favorite shows. I would have, I would have loved to have done something based on that. And there's, there's a few others floating around. Um, uh, of what's currently on deck, I would, I would love to do a Penny Dreadful novel. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually picking that license up or not, but I love that show. Um... You know, uh, so yeah. I mean, there's all, there's always some. Um, I, I've been fortunate, and then I've gotten to work in a lot of uh, universes that I was already a fan of in the first place. I mean, Star Trek's the obvious one. I've been I've been I have been watching Star Trek since birth, really. <laughs> uh, Given the long mother, retrospective um, rewatch reviews that you do for Tor. dot com, yeah. I'm yeah. somehow not surprised by this. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I, I, and so getting to write Star Trek novels and comic books and, and reference books and all the rest of it, and doing the rewatch has just been a thrill. Um, I was a huge fan of Farscape, and um, I not only got to write a Farscape novel and a couple of short stories, but I got to work with the show's creator, Rockne O'Bannon, on uh, three years' worth of comic books for Boom Studios that picked up Farscape after its finale. Um, we basically did the unofficial, well, official, really, season five of the show. Which was oh, great. Nice. That was one of the that was one of the best experiences of my writing career. Just being able to work with Rockney um, uh, on those stories uh, and to continue and to be the official continuation of Farscape uh, moving forward was was fantastic. You know, um, I love that. That and and that came out of me already being a Farscape fan in the first place. So, so in I, that kind of. Um leads me to a tangential question um there is a expression in the fanfic community um which is jost which is what happens <laughs> yes <laughs> those, i'm familiar with that term yes for those who for those watching who are not familiar with the term um when you establish something in your story you you're sort of when you're working in a, a corner of the fiction universe and establish something that has not been discussed in the stories and then the show or whatever the the original content uh, source comes along and writes the um, writes something different that invalidates what you created you have just been jost <laughs> that ever the, happened the, to you it hasn't happened to me directly um there was one minor comment, a throwaway comment in a Farscape episode that kind of just my Farscape novel, but not really. It, it was a minor thing and could be easily papered over if, if needs be. Um, in general, um, it, it, it happen, it, 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 it's a risk when you're writing something that ties into an ongoing series. Um, it was the sort of thing that could have happened easily with, for example, the three Supernatural novels that I wrote, all of which, you know... Uh, were written as this as the series was going on, and, and there was a very real danger of that happening. But I was lucky in that I didn't. Usually, especially with tie-ins, they're 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 careful to avoid that. That that's what the approvals process is there for. Um, it, it's more common in fanfic where they don't have that level of oversight or that level of of access. You know, um, there were a couple of things I was able to put into my supernatural novels that I knew about because um, I was given scripts ahead of time, or I was told, you know, this we're going to be establishing this down the line. Um, but it, it happens. There was one of my favorite examples of it actually uh, is one that actually that, that um, I think it predates uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer by a little bit. But it's um, uh, 
it was on Deep Space Nine. Uh, writing Deep Space Nine novels was always a pain in the ass because uh, the show was constantly changing the status quo and revealing things and such. Um, and so the producers threw Simon and Schuster a bone and said, as, as they were um, gearing up, they said, okay, for the third season, we're going to be adding a ship called the Defiant. It's going to be assigned to the station. So... Um, so they were able to put in these with the books that were going to be published around the beginning of the third season. They were able; those were fairly late in the production process at that point. But they were able to insert a couple of throwaway references to the Defiant, just to have them there, so it would look like the 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 the, the books were up to date with with uh, continuity. The problem is they well they told them that the Defiant was going to be attached to the station. They didn't say that the same episode in which the Defiant was going to be assigned to the station was the one where Odo was going to find out who his people were. So there's a bunch of novels, there's about three or four novels that take place in this weird limbo where the Defiant has been assigned to the station, but Odo still doesn't know who he is. Oh, man. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that, that happens sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and there's really no way to avoid it, you know. Uh, I, th- I think it happened to Ashley McConnell in one of her Quantum Leap novels back in the day, too. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's less common now, partly because um, the production offices of the TV shows are getting more are more involved with tie-ins than they used to be. Um, right. It was for a very long time. It was exceedingly rare that the tie-ins would get the notice of anybody outside the licensing office. Um, the the producers of, uh, particularly Deep Space Nine and Voyager, were a lot more open to, to helping out Simon and Schuster as much as possible. Um, but And part of that was because the producers uh, on those shows were actually ones who had read Star Trek novels, you know, in the past, and so were more supportive of it. And now you're getting a lot of, a lot of the people who are showrunners and, and scripters and producers and directors and such are people who grew up reading tie-in fiction and so have a much greater affinity for it. Um, yeah than once before. Like, like a, the, the, the Heroes experience I'm going through right now is a perfect example. These guys are very much into making sure that the tie-in fiction, uh, you know, whether they're doing some comic books, they're doing these novellas that we're writing, and so on, that all of them are going to be part of the overall tapestry of the show and making sure everything's consistent. They did that when the show aired the first time, too. And, um, and so that, that level of cooperation means being just is less likely to happen, for one thing. <laughs> um... Uh, I mean, and, and it can still happen. Um, I mean, in a sense, it's going to be happening shortly uh, when the new Star Wars film is released, um, because well, that's just going to completely throw out all of the years and years and years of continuity of the expanded universe. Well, yeah, because they're they don't want their storytelling to be hamstrung by a bunch of novels that are only, were only read by less than one percent of their audience, and which um, vary wildly in quality. Well, that's that's neither here nor there as far as they're concerned. I mean, the, 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 the tie-in fiction, like I said, the, 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 the numbers are such that the tie-in fiction really only re- it reaches, of any tie-in fiction, reaches less than 10% of the audience of the thing it's tying into. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, the least popular Star Trek episode ever aired still reaches well over a million people. Yeah, and that's, tie-in novels that's a good point. Very, yeah. And and tie-in novels very rarely reach the seventh figure, um, so yeah, the I, I can understand why they don't. I mean, one of the reasons why the Star Wars expanded universe had such freedom to do what they wanted was because there weren't any plans to do any more movies. Yeah, um, nobody you know, cares. <laughs> yeah, um, the, I mean, the same thing happened with Doctor Who fiction when when Doctor Who went off the air. Um, in in the uh, in the late in 1989, Virgin Publishing was given free reign to do whatever the hell they wanted because there wasn't a new Doctor Who. Then of course, you know, 2005 comes along and now there is, and so a lot of the stuff they established was invalidated to some extent. Although with Doctor Who continuity is a fluid thing anyway. Um, exactly, wibbly yeah. wobbly, timey wimey. Yeah. and stuff. and they even adapted. I mean, there have been a couple of uh, pro stories that have been adapted. Uh, Paul Cornell's Human Nature. Um, 
Uh, Blink was adapted from a short story Stephen Moffat had written. So you know, the the so was Dalek was based on a short story also. They they've they've mined the tie-in fiction for for story ideas anyway. Nice. Um, so the uh, but that sort of thing will happen. You know, I mean, it even happened with Star Trek. The the up until you know the the Bantam novels could pretty much do whatever the hell they wanted, and even. Um, uh, the, the other tie-in fiction had a certain amount of freedom because at best there was a movie every couple of years and that was it. It wasn't until Next Generation debuted in 1987 that they started being much harsher with what they could do. And then again, once shows started going off the air, the tie-in fiction got a little freer. Uh, I, I remember back in the 90s, one of my favorite books that I, I read as a, as a young teen um, was a... It was, it was called Dark Mirror. It was uh, by yeah. Diane Duane. And... Yes. Uh, it was her riffing off of the Mirror Mirror universe using the Star Trek Next Generation characters. And I loved her vision for where things went. And I, it took the longest time for me to adjust mentally to what Deep Space Nine did with the Mirror universe when they came along because they had just jossed all of these this whole story <laughs> that I had loved for like 20 years. The, thing is, the story's still there. The the there's nothing in that happened on Deep Space Nine that makes Diane's book go away. It's still there. It's still a perfectly valid story choice. I mean, that there's not everything is going to be completely internally consistent, and it's and it's not even a desirable goal necessarily. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but you know, people always say, you know, well the novels aren't canon, so why should I care? You know what else isn't canon? The entire Marvel Cinematic Universe is not canon. <laughs> That's an excellent point. <laughs> it isn't. You know the the. The the comics are the canon of that, um, you know the the these are yeah, the, the the Marvel what Kevin Feige is doing is tie-in fiction basically, um, and you know it is having some influence on the comics certainly because uh, they're they're immensely popular, uh, but even so the 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 basics of the comics haven't really changed to uh, to that. Um, it's it's those are not canon either. I mean, there's there's three different versions of Sherlock Holmes that are relatively current. You've got Elementary, you've got Sherlock, you've got the Robert Downey Jr. films, you've got the new Ian McKellen film. Um, all, none of those are compatible with each other, but they're still all popular and they're still all very good. Um, well, I'm assuming the, the McKellen film is good. I haven't seen it yet, but the yeah, the, I can't wait to see that. Yeah, but but the the Downey the Downey Jr. films were I thought were actually excellent. Um, the, and both Elementary and Sherlock are fantastic shows, two really completely different and yet both really good updates of, of Holmes in the modern times. Um, they can they can coexist. Um, one of the most popular Star Trek novels was called Federation. It was by Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens. Um, it was basically invalidated by the movie Star Trek First Contact, but it didn't stop it from being a popular novel, and it didn't stop First Contact from being a popular movie. They were just two different interpretations of, this, of basically the same story, of, of Zephyr Cochran's first warp flight. Um, a good story is still a good story. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's worth getting worried about what's real in a fictional construct. Yeah. As a, as a, um, a, a compulsive world builder, I have a hard time with this, <laughs> but I can see the, the argument. For what you're what you're describing, <laughs> I mean, consistency is is nice, and it's and it's good when it's there, but it's not always practical, and it's not always even necessarily desirable, you know. Yeah. So tell us a little I'm bit. I'm perfectly happy to live. Your... I'm perfectly happy to live in a world that has both Joss Whedon's Avengers and Stanley and Jack Kirby's Avengers in it, you know. Fair enough. Tell us a little bit about your original fiction. Um, what have you done recently? What are you excited about? What are you working on? Uh, my original, the the main, the, the, there are two main uh, universes of my own that I, that I've been doing fiction in lately. Uh, one is uh, a high fantasy police procedural series, which is basically I, I refer to it as Law and Order meets Lord of the Rings. Uh, <laughs> one reviewer called it Dungeons and Dragnet. Uh, nice. It's starting in a novel. Yeah, I love that. I loved that. That was that was my favorite uh, review comment. Uh, the first novel was called Dragon Precinct, uh, and I've done four novels so far, with a fifth uh, forthcoming. Um, those have all been published by Dark Quest Books, uh, and I've also done a short story collection called Tales from Dragon Precinct, 
and I've been doing more short stories in the in the milieu as well. It's uh, you know it takes place in in a, a fantasy setting, you know, with humans and elves and dwarves and wizards and stuff. Uh, but the main characters are detectives who solve crimes. And um, uh, I've, uh, as I said, I've done a four novels in a short story collection uh, that are available from Dark Quest. I've also been doing a cycle of short stories that take place in Key West, Florida. These are urban fantasy stories involving rock and roll music, scuba diving, Norse mythology, folklore, and beer drinking. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, about nine of the stories have been collected in a collection called Ragnar Rock and Roll, Tales of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. Um, there's also a story up on Buzzy Mag online, uh, which is free on the web. You can go check that. Go to buzzymag.com, and you can read the story called Down to the Waterline. Uh, and uh, I've also had um, uh, the anthology Out of Tune um, has a Cassie story in it. There's also, um, I just uh, Dark Quest also just put out a short story collection of mine called Without a License, which is... Uh, original fiction of mine that isn't in a licensed world, uh, including a new Dragon Precinct story and a new Cassie Zukov story. Uh, and that's nice. available right now, too. So, uh, currently I'm working on the Heroes Reborn novella. Um, I've got a Stargate SG-1 novel called Kali's Wrath, which should be coming out either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Um, and uh, I'm doing... Uh, I mentioned V-Wars, which is a shared world thing Jonathan Mayberry created. There's going to be a third V-Wars anthology called Night Terrors, which I'm going to have a short story on. That'll be out uh, in October, just in time for Halloween. And uh, IDW just released an X-Files anthology that I have a story in, which Jonathan also edited. Uh, it's called Trust No One, and uh, has a bunch of new X-Files story by, by X-Files stories by a bunch of different people, including me. Um... The, the title of that one is called Back in El Paso, My Life Will Be Worthless. And, Say that um, again? Back, it's a song lyric. Uh, back in El Paso, My Life would, Will Be Worthless. Gotcha. Um, it takes place in El Paso, which is how I use that title. Um, uh, what I wanted to do was a story where the point of view character is a normal FBI agent who has to work with Mulder and Scully. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, basically, I just wanted to get into the, get into the heads of what... What do the what do the other federal agents? How do they view Mulder and Scully? How do they you know? How do they interact with them? Um, that is a great question. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I thought that would be a fun thing to do, uh, and uh, so you know, I did that, and those those are all coming out later this year. Um, the Heroes Reborn novella should be coming out. I'm not sure when exactly because it it has to be released after. It's going to be the last one, and I don't know when. It has to be released after a particular episode because my story has spoilers for a particular episode in it, and I don't know when that episode is going to air, so I'm not sure exactly what the release date is. But um, it'll be sometime after. The, the the series itself is debuting in September. The novellas are going to be released. Uh, there are going to be six of them, and mine is actually the last of them. So um, they're going to be coming out alongside the series uh, as it goes along this fall and, uh, and into, the, into the new year. So Very cool. Where can people find you online? Uh, they can go to decandido.net, which is a horribly out-of-date uh, website. Um, I, I refer to it as, as cheerfully retro um, because <laughs> I haven't really changed the design since 1996. Um, wow. I really need to work on that. Um, but it's mostly just mostly it's just basically a, a, a link source. You can, you can uh, order my books from there, and it links to my Facebook page, my blog, my Twitter feed. Um, to the various podcasts that I'm involved with, including the Chronic Rift podcast. Uh, it links to the to the rewatches I've been doing on Tor.com and uh, and so on. Uh, awesome. And in fact, you can find me on Tor.com twice a week, generally. Uh, on Tuesdays, I'm doing a Star Trek original series rewatch. On Fridays, I'm doing a, Star Tra a Stargate uh, seasonal rewatch. Um, I'm not doing individual episodes. I'm just covering each each season and each movie as its own entry. Um, and uh, in the past, I've also got archived the Star Trek: The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine rewatches that I do for them. And having uh, read through a lot of the Deep Space Nine uh, rewatches and about half of the Next Generation rewatches, um, if you're a fan of these shows, folks, um, go back and read these um, rewatches. You'll fall in love with the series all over again. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time, Keith, and uh, thanks pleasure. for coming on Raven and the Writing Desk. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks for having me. All right. And...